Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have Operation Wolf, released in 1988 by Ocean and Tato. The developer was Colin Porch and the musician was Jonathan Dunn. I'll be having a look at the tape and the disc version and the disc version is just going to be first. I think that's how I'm going to do it. So there seem to be four files on the original disc image. Loader, F, V code and wolf pick. This is my tweaked version of C1541. So I added a recover command which hunts through the whole disc and looks for chains of blocks, tracks and sectors basically, and then saves them out. This allows me to see if there are any hidden files on the disk. Now these files are zero kilobytes long. They don't contain any data, so I'm just going to delete them. The files, when they're recovered, have a track and sector identifier added to their name so I can see where they have come from. So this file 18, on track 18 sector zero is actually the block allocation map and also the disk directory entry. It's Interesting to note that there are four files visible in the directory and I can see those four files there actually in the raw directory information as well. But excluding the directory file, there's actually five files that have been recovered. I'm going to rename these files a little bit so that I can actually match them with what is in the directory. So the loader file is at track 17 sector 0 or in hex it is at 11 and then 0 you can see that and then 11 track 11 in hex and then sector 1 in hex is the F file the next file starts at 13 in hex which is actually 19 in decimal and that's the code which is a very large file. You can see it takes up almost the whole memory on the Commodore 64. And then the last one is Wolfpick that starts at track eight, sector zero, which is this one here, which leaves the 50 kilobyte file at track 17, sector three, which isn't in the directory, but it was recovered from the disk. I had a little check earlier on and the original disk is meant to be using something called VMAX 3 protection. To be honest, I don't remember this disk having that much protection. I think it was actually possible to copy all of the files from the disk and then just run them. Uh, you didn't even need the uh, bootloader, to be honest. But hey, there we go. Now, the start of this file does look like game data. It also loads at 400 in hex, we could see that from the first two bytes of the file. There we are, 00, zero and zero, 04. So in low and high byte order, that means switching them around to be higher than low byte, it's 400 in hex or 0400 zero, zero in hex, which is the start of the default screen. The default screen starts at 400 in hex, which is 1024 in decimal. I'm just having a quick little look through the data in this file here, and it doesn't seem to be scrambled. It doesn't seem to be scrambled or, or encrypted with a more robust algorithm. Let's put it like that. It might be scrambled with a simple XOR value, potentially, but then I wouldn't expect to see so many of these uh, zero uh, consecutive runs of zeros in the file as well. I'm just having a quick look at the text extraction tool output. There does seem to be quite a lot of kind of text, but it doesn't seem to correspond to any uh, immediately obvious encoding method. It kind of makes me think that perhaps it's using an XOR value of uh, maybe just one or two bits. The wolf picture, the, the, I'm guessing that's the loading screen seems to load at C800, so all the way up in memory, you would kind of expect that if you wanted the loading screen to be on as, as long as possible, then if you're loading from the bottom of memory up to the top, then you would want the loading screen to be right at the end. 
Let's load this into ICU debugger with the memory bank set to be RAM, just to see what we can see. We can see the memory range that it's loaded it at. It's at C800 in hex all the way up until the end of memory. And there we are, there's the bitmap data. Interesting to note that hidden in the loading screen there's actually two M and there's some numbers with a dot in the middle. You don't see that while it's loading. 1835, maybe that's the time it was completed, or maybe that's just a reference number for the artist. These are just the two screens. There seems to be some extra data as well, maybe. Let's see what we get if we just load the raw the code file, which is that very large 63 kilobytes file. Almost the whole of the memory, and we can see it's at 400 all the way up to CA6E. Hmm, interesting. So it's overloaded a portion of the bitmap data, but all the data that was loaded for the bitmap. Some of the bitmap, most of the bitmap is actually left in the main memory, of course, but oh look, actually it's not even uh, scrambled. Uh, I can see some nice raw sprites there. The third last sprite in the bottom right hand corner as well, I can see that that's used for the vertical life or energy meter during the game um, that co probably covers over the, the split between uh, the, the score status panel and the scrolling area of the screen. So file 17.3 uh, seems to contain a large chunk of game data as well. Hmm. So it seems that we've got two copies of duplicate data, almost two copies of duplicate data, I mean the, the, the file 17 underscore 3, which isn't named in the directory because it doesn't appear in the directory, uh, doesn't have as much data as the code file at 50 kilobytes compared to 63 kilobytes. There's 13 kilobytes roughly of data difference there, with the recovered file being shorter by 13 kilobytes. Here I'm just looking for 78A9, which is a set interrupt flag and then load accumulator which is often used as like a startup routine not always but it seems to be you know quite common a, a quite common a sequence of bytes for a startup routine i don't see what looks like a, a really proper game start we can of course have a look at the uh, loader we can analyze the loader when it's actually working to see what game start address it actually uses We'll do that later on, I guess. I'm just filling the memory and reloading this recovered file. It seems to be missing quite a lot of data at the end of memory. We can see that look, the memory view is, or the bitmap memory view is showing that to be nice and blank now, quite empty. I'm starting to lean towards the uh, thought that maybe this is not a complete recovered file. It's entirely possible. There is certainly some code there at 6D2F onwards and this seems to be some data or something. I'm thinking now that I need a little automatic utility to scan for, for more common <laughs> code startup routines. Uh, that's something to put on the to-do list, isn't it? There's a whole bunch of different kind of like combinations that you can look for. Most of them to be set interrupt, load x immediately with ff transfer x to stack. Sometimes it's set interrupts, sometimes it's set the processor port for mapping the RAM and then transferring x to the stack. There are various different permutations of this. But we know that the code is not even scrambled and we know that it looks like it looks, it, it, it appears to be the start it appears to be identical at the start data, certainly. It's rather intriguing. You know, when I added this recover command to my tweaked version of C1541, I actually started finding sometimes small little files which had been left on there by the developers and then uh, deleted, I guess, when it went through the mastering process. So I would find little basic loader programs which would load the individual chunks of memory from files and then the mastering process would remove all trace of those files in the directory. And well, we can see here, look, in Beyond Compare, which is an excellent comparison tool. I use it very often. 
uh, we can see that it's practically identical until the last, I don't know, what is that, the last fifth, maybe, of the file, the, the red bar down at the bottom left hand corner of the screen that you can see now indicates that that's where the differences are. But the start of the file is absolutely exact. So the code file on the left is the what I assume the full data file for the game code and everything else. And then the file 17 underscore 3 on the right is the file that was recovered by scanning linked tracks and sectors, blocks basically on the disk. We can see on the bitmap view for the last bank of RAM in the Commodore 64, we can see that when we load the, the code file, which is the full game data file I'm guessing now, we can see that it contains an awful lot of data all the way up at high memory. Uh, it looks like character sets maybe and some code. Quite a lot of code perhaps. I would have a sneaky feeling that this game uh, that removes all of the ROM, so, so all of the basic and the kernel ROM, so giving a lot of RAM in higher memory. So we can see that there's a small overlap of about 256 bytes, roughly, just guessing there, but it looks about right. That The uh, recovered file on the left now contains a lot of repeated 01s, and the larger real game data file, the code data file on the right, contains a lot more data. So because the differences occur at what looks like, uh, ignoring the two bytes at the beginning of the file, it looks like the differences start on a 256 byte boundary page in memory. I'm beginning to think that the recovered file is even more strongly now not the full amount of data. We can test that by having a look at the chain command. And for the recovered file, chain uh, track and sector 17 and 3, so track 17, sector 3. Aha, we can see here, look, uh, the last block is saying try reading data from track 75, which is, of course, out of bounds. So, yeah, I don't think it contains all of the data. I think. It's probably a deleted file or something like that. If we have a look at the file chain for the code file, which starts at track 19, sector 0, and we can see here that it's got a full uninterrupted blockchain. Now, I don't see immediately any overlap between the blocks used for the recovered file compared to the code file. And I don't, I don't see that at all. I don't see that block and sector, uh, track and sector, sorry, I don't see that block, which is the track and sector, being reused by any other file apart from the code file. So this tells me now that the recovered file is a partial file and it, it's not really any usable data. So I think we can re uh, ignore the recovered file for now. And I think that we can just concentrate on finding out the real game code start address. And I think that we'll do that by analyzing the disk loader first. So the loader file seems to load at 316 in hex. We can see that from the first two bytes of the file. The loader file, I will not be surprised if it loads the F file, which then loads, there we go, there's the F file, and we can immediately see the text for wolf, pick, and the code, so it looks like immediately that it's going to try and load those two files. There seems to be a bunch of extra code here. I saw in that file as well what looked like an MW and a, a memory write command. So there is some drive code. Uh, the game, I remember the game did load with quite a quick load. So I'm guessing here that we're going to see a 2-bit protocol for the fast loader. 
and uh, probably some kind of like protection check but like I say I, I seem to remember that the original disc was was very easy to just you know load the file and actually just run it I mean that was many many years ago I don't remember the start address anymore obviously but uh, when you have two files on the disc which says I am the loading pick and I am the game code you are naturally going to and I naturally uh, experimented with them this is an original disc image as well or it's meant to be an original disc image okay so there, there we go the loader code definitely does a set LFS set now with a one byte long file and it starts as 395 in hex and then of course yes it loads the file and it jumps to be a 0 completely expected we can see here that it does a set interrupt load x to access We've got a whole bunch of set nam, set LFS, set LFS, set nam, listen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. open. So, yes, it's doing a name, open, name, open, uh, setting the secondary address, doing a whole bunch of character outs. And then, look, it's setting a default input, it's a check in and get in down at BA57, so it looks like it's getting a byte returned from the drive we can see it's sending an initialization command perhaps a user command it's probably uh, the simplest way that it uses to get code into the drive's memory and actually start executing it there are several different ways of getting the commodore 64 to tell the drive to execute code there are several different drive commands that you can use to do that for you. So at this point, I'm thinking I better put some breakpoints. These are at various different positions just after the, say for example, open completes. Um, and also I should probably put a breakpoint. Yeah, so this first one sets a BA86 so that sends the uh, I0 colon. The next one which sends data from uh, was it BA89 which is at BA2B the code there that sends the next string. Mm. So it's actually sending one character for the name and then it's sending the rest of the command with the what is it C I out I'm guessing so I'm setting a breakpoint on the drive between 200 and 800 in hex because that's basically uh, almost as much memory as you can realistically look to execute code in, in drive memory it doesn't have that much RAM so I'm going to put a little breakpoint here too uh, on the push accumulator PHA instruction here so that looks like it's storing the value which is, it, which is returned by the drive. It does two closes uh, because it did two opens previously. An intriguing way of doing it. The drive disassembly is not enabled and that's because true drive... Ugh, I've forgotten to turn on true drive in ICU. Let's turn on true drive emulation. Okay. Let's start that little thing again, uh, this time with the correct disk image. There we go. Right, now we're back at where we should be. <sighs> it's still running uh, Commodore 64 code at the moment, and it's still running... It has, still hasn't hit the breakpoint in the drive's RAM, so we know that the drive is still running its code from its internal ROM still. Look at how uh, the track indicator seeps around on the disk a little bit before the byte is returned by the disk. Well, at this point, it doesn't seem to be running any code in the drive. It just seems to be uh, executing commands on the drive using standard, basically standard DOS drive commands, which is really intriguing. It's intriguing because uh, it's unusual to see the standard DOS commands being used 
to read information from the drive in a game like this. Usually the game wants to send drive code as quickly as possible and run its own protocols as soon as possible because it makes it harder to reverse engineer what's going on. Here it's using standard kernel functions a lot which if you use standard kernel functions a lot it makes it easier to reverse engineer what you're trying to do with the drive eventually. <clears throat> so let's rerun the disk again uh, get back to that point this is the advantage of using emulation. It's a lot easier and quicker to get back to where you were again. Uh, so I'm not delving too deeply into the precise flow of this load of code at the moment. What I'm actually looking for is that I'm looking for the game start address. I can see there a BA76, there's a jump to 150. Now that's quite suspicious, isn't it? Look, see. So it does a comparison with what's returned. And it seems to be uh, passing the checks. BA79. Da, 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 da. So whatever checks it was doing, it seems to have passed. Hmm. Probably, probably trying to read a particular sector on the disk, which is known to be bad. Or track, or block, or whatever. Um. <laughs> Nothing too interesting, I guess. It does a couple of closes. Look, we'll get back out to where we are. And a jump to B, A, 9, 9. It goes here. So closing all the channels and files, close all files. Oh, look. When the drive starts executing drive code, Eventually, the Corridor 64 is running some code down in the stack at 17F. I can see on the drive side at 6D, it is setting up and sending the uh, E0 job code to memory location 03 in hex at 60F there. So that basically says, uh, what is it, uh, seek to a particular track and then execute code at the beginning of the buffer, in this case it's probably buffer 600 in hex in the drive's memory. There's no guarantee for that, but it's it's likely. And then the execute job code will be executed by the drive's ROM routines. It's a little way of um, obfuscating a code execution path in the drive an intriguing way of doing it. You know, I see that methodology quite often. If you don't know exactly what the job code does, then it's non-obvious. The drive uh, processes these job codes with a little timed interrupt, you see. So when it realizes that there is a new code in this particular job slot, which is at 03 here, where I've just put the breakpoint, the timer interrupt will come along in the drive ROM and it will execute the code. I can see here in the Corridor 64 side at 196 and stuff and a little bit above there, there seems to be a two bit protocol. Look, one, two, three, four, yeah, one, two, three, four loads from DD00, which is CIA2, port A, serial port. So, yes, there's a two bit protocol which would account for how fast the load is, is actually relatively speedy. Just putting some notes here in my little notes text file. And of course I'll be committing this to source control so you can actually look at the notes as well, the ones that I'm typing in at this moment. And you can find out from reading the notes how I use the various tools to look at the various bits of data. I can see the memory write and memory execute commands in that uh, graphics map in the text screens in ICU on the far right hand side there m-w and m-e they're not even stored reversed in memory normally they're stored reversed because they are loaded with a decrementing index in, in either in the X or the Y register but this they, they're just you know, there <laughs> fine <laughs> so on the drive I've cleared the ranged breakpoint and I'm putting a uh, a couple of different ranges now to exclude the job code 
weight loop, which is at 6E1 and 6E3. So I don't want the load a, a, a load accumulator with 0, 3 and the branch to be included. All right, but everywhere else in the drive's memory, I'm putting a breakpoint so we can see how quickly the drive starts executing custom code, user code basically. And, and it's going to do that while it's processing the E0 job code, which will almost, there we go. And the drive has started executing from 600. Well, that's not a surprise, no surprise whatsoever. I can see at 6.07 in the drive's memory already that there is a BVC branch on overflow clear. So the drive is basically signaling via its flag to say that it has, what was it? The overflow flag was uh, the, the sync marker reached, right? So the tracks and sectors in between each block, there are sync markers which tell the drive that you're just about to start encountering data. Then we could see that you're pulling data. Uh, actually, it's not a sync marker, it's a byte ready marker. Sorry, the overflow flag on the, on the drive side of things is a byte ready at 1C01, which is the byte that's just read in from the head, the drive's head. So uh, the sync marker check is actually a different piece of code. I remember now. Yes, the overflow flag is a byte ready signal. And that's why the overflow is cleared by the code immediately afterwards. We can see it's reading raw bytes, GCR encoded bytes, usually from the drive head and it's storing them at 300 this time. There is almost certainly a little bit of decode, obviously, and then it sends it via its 2-bit protocol back to the Commodore 64. And it's a fairly optimal 2-bit uh, protocol. I mean, it's not as optimal as the uh, GMA loading fast load, which is super optimal. Uh, that uses a, a table offset by 8 bytes, and you can see that in one of my other videos. But this one is, you, is doing a load, and then it's doing a shift and a rotate, and a shift and a rotate. So it's extracting 2 bits per loaded data, uh, you know, which is perfectly fine. It's pretty optimal. Instead of doing a, a table index load, it's, it's doing it two shifts and two rotates basically per bit, which is cool. These little load accumulators with the E00 uh, twice, uh, followed by a no-op, those load accumulators are superfluous. They don't do anything. It's reading one byte from RAM twice and then throwing, the, throwing away the result of that read. It's probably there for timing. Maybe there was something uh, changed in the loader. Maybe this loader code was ripped out from somewhere else and a particular thing has been, you know, like knocked out but not quite knocked out. Maybe they didn't want to change the timing of it so they changed it to load a superfluous address twice. We can see here on the drive side that, that, that there is the 2-bit protocol send. It looks like it anyway. Again, nothing too surprising. We can see here that the Commodore 64 has seen that the 1BF is the end of the byte receive routine on the Commodore 64 side. We can see it's received the byte 08 in the accumulator. It's then doing another byte receive on the Commodore 64, we're not that interested in it. So 680 on the drive code side of things, look the accumulator is set with 0A, which it looks like it promptly tries to send the value in the accumulator to the Commodore 64 and we've got a breakpoint now on the Commodore 64 at the end of the receive byte routine which is highlighted in red, which ends at 1BF. And we can see when the drive sends the value, the Commodore 64 receives the same value. So we're going to see that the values are the same. This means it's a very obvious drive transfer routine here. 
if it wasn't obvious enough already by it reading serial data via the CIA2 serial port register, it's extremely obvious that the drive is sending this information via its serial port and then the Trinus Commodore 64 is receiving it. So since we know where now on the Commodore 64 side of things where the uh, byte receive routine is, we just need to tran we just need to uh, continue on a little bit now to see where the byte store is and then usually near where the byte store is for storing the received bytes from the drive to the Commodore 64's memory near there there is usually some kind of like jump or JSR or start the game code thing somewhere so we'll just hunt around a little bit until we see something which looks like a jump for the game start 14F on the Commodore 64, I can, or 14D on the Commodore 64's memory there, load accumulator, uh, hash dollar 7F, store it in the interrupt control registers, that seems to turn off the interrupts for IRQs and NMIs, which is rather interesting. So that, that looks like it might be the end of the drive load routine, right? Uh, finishing at 15F. So it's actually quite a small little optimal routine for doing the drive transfer. And it sets the processor port memory map register as well. Uh, 15B look to a nice default value and there's the RTS at the end. We'll put a break there. Here we go. So it's loading a whole chunk of data and we can see it's loading that title screen file. And it's exited. It's just about RTS return from subroutine. So we know that that is definitely the end of load there. If we step back out now, and we go back to where we were being called from, we can see it manipulates the process part. We can see it's setting uh, VIC memory. Yeah, it's setting the VIC memory in screen mode and stuff like that by the look of it. And it is probably going to Oh look, it's doing a, it's probably going to display the screen at this point. It was then doing a check with the raster position on the screen and then it looked like it was doing some like, kind, of, kind of like delay. So it's displaying the screen for a certain period of time. There is a little delay counter here going on in the code. Self-modifying its own uh, byte. And then it's continuing to load. Cool. Okay. Look, it's loading all of that lovely game data. And it's loading it all in one chunk. It's stomping all the way through memory. There we go. Chunk, 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 chunk. Finish. Oh, and look, there we go. There it is. 4240. Looks like the game start, doesn't it? 4240 in hex. And there we go. Load X. Hash dollar FF TXS SEI. So it's that way around in the game code. That's another subtle permutation or subtle difference in in how to start your code. What it does is that it claims all of the stack for yourself and it stops the interrupts. It's then doing a clear decimal, <laughs> which is another instruction which you don't tend to use very often. There we go, we've got two options here. Uh, F1 for Neo's mouse and then F3, what was it, for, for joystick and POC2. Oh, the graphics were by uh, Steve Wahid. <coughs> Apologies, Steve, your name wasn't actually in the credits that I saw. At this point in the game, once the game actually starts running its code, I don't think it runs any more drive code checks. Unusually, I'm going to use the mouse. I don't use that option very often. So that was the disk loader. Actually, really very, very simple. No scrambling, no encryption. 
no real difficult checks going on there as far as I could see. Uh, the two-bit protocol was very obvious. Now we can see that there are two character sets, one at 7,000 uh, 7, and one at 7,800 7, in hex. We can see that the bottom of the screen uses the character set which is being used for the title screen, uh, introduction communications message. And then the character set, which is there, it, it seems to flip to a different character set for the middle part of the screen or for the upper part of the screen, which is where the actual scrolling level comes in. So we have two character sets up at the end of this second Vic Bank, uh, along with all of the sprites that we can see at the beginning, first half and a bit of the uh, Vic Bank. We can see that the two, the two screens are just before the two character sets at um, 6800 and 6C00. Now we can see here, if you notice, when the screen is scrolling on the left, it uses a double buffered screen. Now the hardware pixel scroll on the left hand portion of the screen, ignoring the screen split for the score status panel at the bottom, the score status panel on the right hand side uses uh, high resolution characters which are of course pixel scroll. Now because they're high resolution characters you can just shift the bits in the characters data one to the left or to the right and then you get a scroll in the opposite direction to where the horizontal hardware scroll is and that means that the score panel status on the right hand side appears stationary because it is scrolling in pixels opposite to how the hardware scrolling is scrolling in pixels. Now the margin between the two parts of the screen, the scrolling area of the screen and the score panel part of the screen on the right hand side is overlaid with sprites because they're not visible in the character screen data. Okay, so we have to really assume logically speaking that they're using the sprites. And we can see in the character set data that the score, the numbers for the score, the bullets and everything else are being pixel scrolled actually in the character cell data itself. Now when it flips to the back to the character set used for the title screen uh, and this game briefing view here actually uses the game level character set. So we're flipping quite rapidly between, between the two character sets and the score status panel down at the bottom is using the title screen character set. So we know that there is a raster split there. So this game layout, this game screen layout is quite clever. The first, the, the last two character rows are stationary. There's no pixel level scrolling, hardware scrolling going on there, it's turned off. So we know that the injury text, for example, the bottom part of the uh, the bottom part of the injury meter is character cells. We know that it's not going to be sprites. We can see there actually that there is a slight little difference in the timing between the pulsing color of the injury meter itself, and that tells us as well that it's using it's using characters rather than sprites. <clears throat> there, there seems to be a slight slight frame lag or something like that between the colors there, right? We can see that the characters, when we use the ROM character set, we can see that the characters themselves are never really, really changing. Again, indicating that, yeah, again, indicating that uh, the high resolution characters in the right just that the character data for the, for the display is just scrolling in pixel terms. Really quite, uh, it's a relatively simple way of, of doing it, but it's, it's a very striking effect, isn't it, to have a screen with a vertical split where one part is scrolling horizontally nice and smoothly without any issues, 
and then the other other part is nice and stuck. And, and the little scrolling wavy lines as well, I think, just basically accent, accentuate the effect of this. You know, the white horizontal scrolly wavy lines. I think it just accentuates the whole thing. What do they look like. They look like high res, right? In more detail, we can see exactly where the sprites are used. So if we're scrolling around, we can see quite clearly that actually the the vertical split for the injury meter is of course sprites. We can see that there's quite a lot of sprite multiplexing going on, and actually the sprites for the helicopter and the back part of the armored vehicle are also using expanded sprites. Which is really quite cool. So it's a it's a mixture of expanded sprites and normal unexpanded sprites. Quite, some quite powerful multiplexing going on there, I think. So there's not very much up and down movement of the uh, enemies. So that simplifies the multiplexer because then you can optimize for the bands. You don't have to optimize for sprites moving around. So that makes it a bit simpler, but even so, the, you know, the multiplexer is quite good. So I noticed that when I tried to do a soft reset, it's actually using the CBM AT vector in the game to do this repeated memory clear, uh, which seems to be a little bit of a self-destruct, but it's not doing a complete self-destruct of the whole memory, so that actually when you try and reset it, it gets stuck back in this uh, routine here, which does just a, a memory page clear. Probably they chose it so that um, this you know memory address here, at 93, 9134 is probably smack bang in the middle of some really important code or something like that or really important data which will basically stop you you know if you try to do a reset it would stop you from trying to examine the, the important part of the game now i know just before i get onto the tape version i want to really check that if we load the code file into empty memory, whether or not we can just jump straight to the memory that we found out from the disk loader. Oh my word, well there we go. So very, very easy to circumvent the disk copy protection. <laughs> yeah, extremely easy. So it's good that this game is actually in a single load. But let's ha now have a look at the uh, tape version. So, analyzing the, the kernel bytes at the beginning, we can see that it says using my uh, tape tool to analyze the tap file, the original tape image, basically, we can see that it's going to say that it's going to run some code at 2A7. So let's, let's double check that. And yes, it does. This is an ocean game. I am almost certain that I know who has written this tape loader already. It looks extremely familiar. It does the standard kind of thing where it's setting up an IOQ, it's setting up an NOI on timers, uh, and also uh, receiving tape pulses, of course, for the IOQ. The NMI is set up on a timer. It then does this infinite branch and not equal. So, we'll see which one wins. And I'm pretty sure that it's going to be the NMI on a timer that's going to win. So let's put one at 3-0 and 3-5-1. Place your bets now which one is going to trigger first. If we get rid of the branch and the equal, there we go. So 3-E-0 has won the race. 351 is very obviously uh, a tape pulse decoder. We can see that it's doing an EOR with five for the border color, the, the flashy loader bars. We can see it's doing a load with the timer high to see whether or not uh, the, the pulse is long or short. 
it's restarting the timer a control using the y register it's doing an e or with two it's doing a shift shift and a rotate so we're getting the long or short pulse length into the carry and then it's shifting the carry into the loaded byte which goes into zero three into zero page as far as i can tell uh yeah it's doing a tape marker code check Da, 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 da. It is it's doing some self-modifying code, but basically, yeah, it's a tape pulse decoding routine. Mm -mm -mm. Yep, it's self-modifying that branch on carry clear as well. <laughs> so yes, very obvious tape loader, very familiar tape loader code. So it's switched on the screen. It's then doing a little check with uh, zero two in hex, of course, which is the bottom of zero page, right at the beginning, almost excluding the process support data direction register and the process support register, register itself at zero zero and zero one. The first usable zero page register is at zero two. So zero pages in memory but you'll notice that I said zero page register and that's because I consider zero page on the 6502 to be an extended register set. It's uh, usually very quick to access this memory because the instructions are one byte shorter than the absolute memory address uh, instructions. So I, I consider the start of zero page and oh look, there we go. <laughs> Hello hacker. Yep, it's freeload version three by Paul H, master of the CIA. So yes, this confirms it. It's Paul Hughes, free load loader. It being an ocean game, this is no surprise. I'm using warp mode here. Uh, warp mode in the ICU version of the device is extremely quick. Standard. Like ocean loader music, we can see the same game data being loaded sequentially through memory. Uh, once it gets to the music routine, it's going to turn off the music, of course. And once it gets to the loading screen, it's also going to switch off the screen at that particular point in time. It's going to black it out. We don't want to see data from tape loading over the loading screen, right? So it's going to switch that off. We can see the color around clear at 908. So the tape loader does not load data completely sequentially. It's going to load all sorts of different data blocks because as we can see from the disk version, as long as the memory layout is the same, it, it the game code assumes that it has got code everywhere from 400 in the hex all the way to the end of memory. So this tape loader code, which is currently running at 900 in hex, is going to need to be overwritten at some point. So I expect at some point we're going to change to a tape loader which is running in the stack, which is at 100 in hex, uh, the start of extended zero page, which is basically the stack and then following uh, the next two pages. So 512 bytes in decimal is the extended zero page. Anyway, so this, this I'm expecting this to, you know, get overwritten unless it's loading it is not loading compressed data we can already see that it's loading raw sprites there is no compression going on here whatsoever uh, the, uh, so there's no optimization for the load time loading time on tape it is literally just loading uncompressed unencrypted unscrambled clear data loading it quickly because freeload is quite quick you know back in the day quick and reliable and relatively easy to duplicate I imagine so I don't see uh, a start for 4240 yet so I'm assuming that there is going to be some loaded code somewhere that, that occurs at some particular point in time there we go, we can see some loaded data going on. And once it gets to the 
music player, it switches off the screen, switches off the music, fades out the SID volume uh, and the voice frequency, blah, blah, blah. It's clearing all of the SID voice. It's clearing all the SID registers basically at 951 in hex in the Commodore 64 code. Here we go. Now loading data over the high chunks of memory. So over the bitmap. Interestingly, it still seems to be executing code up at the high part of memory, probably for the music play routine. Is that? It loaded a little chunk in the the beginning of memory, probably some very high up or very low down, sorry, zero page registers, probably. Mm -hmm. Oh look, 957 is jumping to the beginning of the stack. It's loaded data at what looks, no, it's not loaded data yet onto the stack, it loaded somewhere else. But very early in zero page by the looks of it. So this is pretty typical for this iteration of freeload. It, it loads data uh, in chunks just to squeeze in as much data that can be loaded into Commodore 64's memory as much as possible. The thing is, is that it doesn't really need to do that if you're going to use compression. If you compressed the whole memory and then ran a decompressor on it, it would load a lot quicker. Anyway, so there we go. It is now, it has now loaded this, the very last bit of code, which does the very last bits of, please store this data somewhere. So we can see here it's doing what looks like maybe some memory clear or memory loading. We'll get there eventually and we'll see what it does, but store accumulator da, 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 da. load da, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding. okay okay oh yeah look it's lo yeah it's doing a load a zero two okay branch on equal one oh two mm -mm -mm -mm. okay so it's doing a lot and there we go there's the jump 4240 in the memory at 149 on the Commodore 64. So it's doing this last little load now. I expect watch out on the on the ICU's memory debug view. One, there we go. It's loading data. Probably over where the music player, but I'm guessing. There we go. The last little chunk of data guessing and hasn't quite got to that jump yet but we're going to get there in a bit almost certainly so I guess it's still continuing to load this last chunk of data there we go and is there another chunk somewhere yeah, it's loading, there we go. So it's loading data now. Uh, over the old tape loader routines and all of that kind of stuff, it was refreshing the beginning of memory for 400 in hex up to about 8 or 900 maybe. A00 in hex perhaps. Now because the game start address is exactly the same as the disk version, I'm saving out the whole of RAM from the start of the screen memory to the end of memory all the way up to the top basically. Typo. It 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 never ceases to amaze me really, even though I've written tape loaders, tape turbo loaders myself, that how small the code is to actually reliably read quite quickly bytes from the tape. So there we go. Now let's just double check the original file from the disk 
original compared to the file that we've just saved from tape and they are practically identical there is there are a couple of bytes right at the end of memory which we're not really interested in and it looks like there's one byte difference here and that looks like it's at the beginning or the end very end perhaps of a particular memory page right up at well uh, so we're missing the first 400 in hex bytes so that's going to be at uh, D uh, C F F F perhaps so there's only one byte difference practically in the whole game compared between the tape and the disk version so there we go tape and disk version practically the same so I think we'll leave this video here we've covered everything I think which is relevant for this game. If you like these kind of deep technical dives into old Commodore 64 games, then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel. And there are buttons specifically for that purpose below. Have a great day wherever you are.